questions about heaven. How do I get in? And will I see God when I get to heaven? Those are the questions before us today for our Bible study. What about the wonders of heaven? I'm Pastor Ken Larson, Visitation Pastor, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And as always, I invite you to our worship services, 830 and 1030. We're at the corner of Swinton and Lake Ida Road in Delray Beach, Florida. Thank you for joining us for the wonders of heaven. And we're looking at what the Bible tells us about heaven. I think a lot of people are interested in what happens after I die. Or there are another, there's another group of people who say, I don't even want to go to think about that yet. I'm not ready to think about uh, heaven yet. Okay. Uh, whenever you get interested, we're here for it. And you can, you can always watch this because it's posted on YouTube. I don't know how long it's going to be there. So the question is, how do we get into heaven? And we started last week by proclaiming the wonderful news that we were not made for death. Jesus shared in our humanity, he took death for us. So point number two to go on from there is an answer to a question that people have and sometimes they're afraid to ask. Lord, will only a few be saved? It's kind of a, a haunting question. There are many people in the world who have different answers to that question. And I wonder if you remember how Jesus answered. Do you? Okay, here are four possibilities. Is this correct? Everyone will be saved? No one will be saved? Most people will be saved. Only a few will be saved. I'm not asking you what you hope the answer will be, but what did Jesus say when the disciples wanted to know, Lord, will only a few be saved? How did he answer? Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try to answer and will not be able. Mm -hmm. Strive, what does that mean? Narrow door, many will try, but won't be able. Was that an answer to his question? Or did that raise other questions in their minds? Well, there's a pretty narrow gate. It's about the narrowest I could find online. Narrow is the gate that leads to heaven. Jesus says, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. You can read that in Matthew chapter 7. The gate is narrow. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, mm -mm. that man is a thief and a robber. And there, I have to say to you, he was really talking about people who pretend to be shepherds and are not. Well, they also will not be in the sheepfold. How do I get to heaven? Narrow is the gate. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That wasn't ego talking. That is the Son of God with power, authority, and he does not say anything ever that is untrue. There's point number three. It's wonderful that we receive an invitation from God. 
and the invitation takes us out of the death that we have at the end of our life without him. He takes us out of that death into life, which is life indeed. Something we actually enjoy here and will enjoy forever. Well, you know the way, don't you? You know the way. And since you believe, you've already passed from death to life, as Jesus says. Evelyn, are you up to read uh, John 20, verse 9? Yes. I am the door. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Thank you. So here, the image is not a gate, but a door, which is essentially the same thing. It's an entry, and the entry is gained only by the invitation of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and specifically through the proclamation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that Jesus is the sacrifice for your sins, for mine. And that's where the invitation comes in, in the gospel message. Believe in me, said Jesus. Point number four, what would or could keep me out of heaven? I hope you never worry about that, but if and when you do, well, let's put the question out there so the answers will be ready in your mind and heart. And you already see a hint of one of the things that could keep any one of us out of heaven if we fall in love with uh, things of this world, specifically the accumulation of riches in any form, whether in coin, investments, and property, and all of the things that this world counts as valuable. So could riches keep me out of heaven? Yes. Read what Jesus said in Matthew 19. Uh, I'll ask you again, Evelyn. Okay. Truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The eye of a needle. I don't know anybody who could go through the eye of a needle. <laughs> if you take it literally. Another interpretation of that is that one of the gates into Jerusalem, and there were many gates, one of the gates was so small that if you were very large, you couldn't go through that, and that gate was called the eye of a needle. There are a couple other interpretations, but Jesus is using this one interpretation, which says that riches make you too large in a lover of things and wealth to go through and enter the kingdom. Now, you understand what he is talking about. If we make of riches or wealth a false god in which we put our trust mm -hmm. for our daily bread, well, who is your god? Yeah. Remember the rich young man who had everything but had nothing? He was told by Jesus, well, go sell what you have and give them all the proceeds to the poor and follow me. Well, that was just too much for the man to give up his riches and he went away sorrowful. Oh, and that showed what his real problem was. It's hard for a rich man or woman to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not impossible. What could keep anyone out of heaven? Jesus said, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Why do you think that's so? I think we just answered it. Is he assuming that this rich person is uh, using their, um, 
worshiping sort of their their riches instead of um, worshiping him. Exactly so. Who is your God? You need to be able to answer that question. Do you worship the God who has revealed himself through his son, Jesus Christ, and all that he did? Or do you have another God in which you put your trust? A small g, God. So what could keep me out of heaven? Are there other things? Yes. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them. And this is that studied look that a teacher gives a student, you know. He looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So it is possible for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because God makes it possible for that person to put away the false God and enter. Now, I must say this, that if you have been richly blessed, according to whatever standard you're using, that doesn't in itself keep you out of heaven. You can possess and still be possessed by the Lord as his child, as his trusting one who knows the source of all good things and then is not troubled by it. This morning, someone sent me, among other Bible passages, uh, I believe it was Proverbs 10, 20. And it, and it tells us that wealth is okay. And when God gives wealth, it doesn't necessarily lead to trouble. And that's a good thing to remember. And also this, wealth is a relative thing. God does not, does not measure things as the world measures things. The word million, <laughs> I'm probably not talking to any millionaires today. But having a million dollars in wealth does not in itself keep you out of heaven. I think I've made that clear. Well, what else could or would keep anyone out of heaven? This is the one you might hope that I wouldn't bring up because you, you could put away your wealth. You could put away uh, going in by other doors, but uh, continuing in sin without repentance. And I underlined and italicized continuing in sin because we all daily sin and need God's forgiveness. But if we continue in sin, there's a very long Bible passage in, in Galatians 5. Let me read that. <clears throat> it takes, so you have to take a deep breath because it's so long. <clears throat> now, though works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, that's a pretty inclusive list. Paul in Galatians 5 is contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. And he is counseling us to walk by the Spirit instead of by the flesh. Now, the flesh is that part of us that still wants sin. Sins like these. So the works of the flesh are those things that we do or think or have when we are following not the spirit which teaches us teaches us to do right but our flesh 
the old Adam, sometimes called. The works of the flesh are evident, and I know and you know that when you look in the world, you see all of these, all of them, the television and the internet have brought these face to face with those of us who are trying to walk by the Spirit. When you walk by the Spirit, you are moved by the Spirit to do what God wants. All right, so you now see the contrast between the two walks. Let me say it even more clearly. The Christian wants to walk by the Spirit, and yet sin's temptation comes in and wants us and tempts us in things like these. So that's why Paul lists them so that people don't walk by these things that would keep you out of heaven if you continued in them without repentance. Let me say it even more clearly. If you are indulging, involving yourself in sins like these, and you refuse to stop, you make no effort to stop, you don't want to stop, then there is no repentance. And though you know about forgiveness, that's withheld from you. So this is a warning to us. If you find yourself here in this group, get out. Ask the Lord in prayer, in repentant prayer, to be the one who leads you out. I don't want to go in any deeper today, but remember, this is if you continue in sin, because there is no one without sin. I think most of our sins are sins of sins of omission. What or would keep me out of heaven? Unbelief, rejecting Christ. I don't believe that those listening uh, to this now would fall into this category, but it could happen. Well, this is what it's like. Uh, Jamie just joined us. Would you be willing to read for us? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Okay, good. Um, Hebrews 3, 12 through 19. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you and in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Or who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that there were, they were unable to enter because of unbelief. I'm not sure if you, you catch the contrast in this rather long paragraph, it was not the sin itself. It was their unbelief. It was God's will that they would enter the rest, but they were disobedient and they did not believe in the one who was leading them. I don't don't mean Moses. The Lord was using Moses to lead them out of Egypt to the promised land. And they did not make it to the promised land, which is a metaphor for heaven. Their bodies fell in the wilderness. And he said, they will not enter my rest. 
you see that this part of Hebrews is, is like a sermon on the text from the book of Exodus. So the writer, and we still don't know who wrote Hebrews, a lot of good guesses, but whoever the writer is writing this um, essay or sermon is showing how those who did not enter the promised land were kept out, not because of their sin, but because of unbelief. In both the Old and New Testaments, there is forgiveness for sin. Yes, there is forgiveness. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. And faith in Christ is the way, the truth and the life. He is the method. He is the means. He is the road. He is the gate. He is the door to get into heaven. Do not harden your hearts. If you find yourself in one of those sins, but if it's a habit, go and get some help. There is help for those who are addicted to sin of any kind, not just the ones that have uh, meetings and steps. There are many addictions and not all addictions are given those steps. The step is repent and believe. Well, I, that's a great tangent, but we're not doing that today. How do I get into heaven? I want you to, to know and believe and take hold of this promise. Evelyn, would you read, please? And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And those are the words that you hear on Sunday in the traditional service, the 830 service, at the end of the absolution. I want you to always believe that this Lord, this Savior, who got it all started in you, who put faith into you at your baptism, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, this, this good work in you, he's going to bring it to completion. Don't be afraid, thinking, well, I might someday lose this. Yes, that's possible, but the Lord is behind it. He wants to bring you with all other believers uh, to a faithful conclusion of this life to enter heaven. And that's how you get into heaven through Jesus, who forgave you and forgives you and will always forgive you. I, th I think you, I think you have this, but if ever there's a wondering, go back to these passages. Okay. Like I, I do that myself. Point number five, the signs of Jesus were written in order to invite you into heaven. The signs, uh, the Apostle John is talking about the signs, the miracles that he performed. And we studied that uh, many months ago when we did an introduction to the Gospel of John. But just this reminder, uh, Jamie, would you read this? Yeah. John 20, 31. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's a great promise. Okay. By believing, how do you get into heaven? Now, believing. The content of that believing. What you believe is that Jesus is the Son of God. And that by believing that, that he died for you and rose for you. So let me give you this two sentence summary. Jesus is the way to heaven because he died for you. Jesus is the way to heaven because he rose for you. That's the, the very concise summary of the way to heaven. If anybody ever asks you, how do I get to heaven? Here's where you can start. 
believe in Jesus. Yes. And all that that means. I think you and I have to realize that our faith has been formed and our faith, our faith has been informed on a rather continuous basis, going back to some date in our history. For some, it's at our mother's knees or uh, Sunday school, Bible class, worship, special studies, self-study, devotions. He is keeping that alive in you so that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Now, I'm going to pause because I have invited you, I got a pencil in hand, in case you have any, you have other questions about heaven. Well, I wonder if we will see, if we'll be able to ask questions when we get there, you know, about the things we've always wondered about, uh -huh. um, you know, <laughs> yeah, how, things, how things work and, and, and why they work that way. And, and mm -hmm. is it true how the world, is, you know, not true, but... Um, does science and and God's plan come together? Do they do they uh -huh. are they in agreement? Okay. You know, if God is the author of all knowledge that is really true knowledge, then He can bring about. A, uh, can I call it a reconciliation between the the, the science and religion debate? Jamie, I have a short answer that is just rather a comical thing, a humorous, is that um, when a person asked a pastor this question and that question and this question and that question, he said, when you get there, I want you to stand in line to get those questions answered. And let me warn you ahead of time, it's going to be a long line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will be. I'll, I'll then give you, a, a, I think, a more comforting answer. And that is, many things that we wonder about now won't matter. Hmm. They, they will dissolve into either, well, now I understand, or I really don't remember have, having those questions. Uh, or if I do... Uh, <laughs> In the glory of heaven, I don't see why I would ever want to know that. If God keeps things from us and it bothers us now, I'm pretty confident it won't bother us then. Do those two smiley face answers help you? Well, yes and no. Okay. Um, no, because... Um... So what you're saying then is when we get to heaven, we'll have no curiosity. Oh, curiosity, a natural human thing that uh, leads to un innumerable questions, science questions about the way the body works. You've studied that okay. and you still don't know the answers. Right. You know, uh, uh, this, this fellow Crick and his partner who discovered the chromosomes and so forth uh, and and have, and since then have mapped it out that begins to answer questions but it raises thousands of other questions mm -hmm. so that knowledge keeps peering into the darkness listen i don't know whether you how much you know about me but i am a lover of science i want to know and I'm on the internet all the time asking questions. I have some about heaven. So if that's a burning question, ask him now in prayer, and I'm not being facetious. And then, uh, like the lecturer sometimes says, would you, 
would you all hold your questions until I'm through with the lecture? And then at the end of the lecture, you say, well, I, I think he answered that. And the real answer that I have for your question is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, well, we won't I, know. <laughs> I'm not sure that I can find a Bible answer to the question of, will I get my questions answered then? I've done the best I could. It's not one of those that I plan to put on the slides and next week or two. <laughs> Pastor, um, Jesus said that uh, in, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Um, are there any other places in the Bible that Jesus describes heaven? Um, yes. I, I don't know what they are. The book of Revelation doesn't sound like an answer, but it is because it is his giving the vision, a single vision, that he gives to the Apostle John and tells him to write these things down. And oh, since it's such yeah. a confusing book with so much numerology and so many visions that are difficult for us to understand, many people don't ever read it, but there are some very clear passages in the book of Revelation. I was I was referring to other than revelation, um, other than revelation, and other yeah. than this question about his answer to many mansions. Uh, yeah, when Jesus when Jesus was on on the earth, mm -hmm. when he was here, okay, when he was teaching, when he was teaching, yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to search my mind and heart and memory a little bit for that, but I wrote it down. Um, other places that Jesus describes heaven. Okay. I'm, I'm going to puzzle over that one because it's not one that I've I've written down already. What happened to my clicker? <laughs> he refers to heaven um, a lot. He he points to heaven and but but he doesn't tell what it's like up there. No, he in in so many words he does not. It's something we wait for. Uh, let me see. Um, let's see if by answering other questions, we get at that. Uh, I can't, uh, I can't see it ahead of time right now. That's okay. Okay. And then uh, don't forget your question and you can bring it up again. That's why I put this slide on there. And I think you figured out by now that I've decided to put a declaration sentences, uh, slides in the gold that is a good contrast color. And that when I am really inviting your questions and answers, I put it in white. Okay. So other questions about heaven that we may get into. Will I really meet God? And I've already decided we will cover this. Mm -hmm. That's quite a uh, meeting God. Who are the saints? I'm not sure how far we're going to go into that, but many people want to know about the saints. Well, what are you talking about? Well, I know my loved ones. This is among the top five questions that I've ever had about heaven. Mm -hmm. Will it be a one grand reunion? That's going to go on for a long time. <laughs> I think that's what we're all hoping. That yes. And, uh, as we been, all want to meet God. We all want to meet our family, mm -hmm. uh, loved ones. Absolutely. Uh, a, a pastor told a child who wanted to know what was heaven like. He said, just think of the, think of the best things that God wants you to want. And then you'll have that. Ice cream cone? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the children have different wants and desires. Another question is, what is heaven like? And I, I had to bring up the question because the answers are so 
to some people, the answers to that question are rather unsatisfying for people this side of heaven. Okay, so kind of let your mind and heart puzzle about that. You probably wonder that yourself. And I do at times. But I kind of take that when I when I am with God in heaven, I'll know. But until then, I won't know fully. And some of these things repeat. That is, the answers to one question are also the answers to other questions. Here's another question. What are we going to do there? <laughs> yeah, that's a good uh, one. <laughs> well, if, if you don't sing in the choir, you'll wonder how, how you're ever going to be outfitted in heaven to, to sing. Don't worry about it. If God wants you to sing, you'll be able. <laughs> and they won't be difficult uh, hymns. And I'm not sure if they will be the ones that came out of our hymn book. What? We've got all those 600 hymns in there. What? No. Um, there's something in the book of Revelation about a, and they sang a new song. What if I don't know it? <laughs> don't worry about that. I'm not trying to treat you as children, but maybe it sounds like it. We could all be singing the Psalms too. Yes, that's, uh, that's a good answer. I like that. And you have other little questions. Um, I don't think you believe in purgatory, but you kind of wonder about it and what it is and why people believe in it and more. The, the angels uh, carry us to heaven. Then, then what? Are they just um, are they necessary anymore? Well, God created them and those who did not disobey. Uh, and all children and even older children like us want to know if there's animals in heaven. I, I talked with my brother in Christ last week, last week, during the past week about this question. I have a tentative answer. Well, there's the place where you can write down your questions. Not really. I, I know you can't write on the slides. Oh, well, just write them down. When you think of things as we go along, uh, write them down and uh, you can send them to me, a text message or an email, or just talk about them here when we gather. And if I don't know the answer, I'll try to be honest. There's a, there's a thing about anyone who teaches, no matter what you teach. No matter what you teach, whether formally in the classroom or just answering people's questions, if you don't know the answer, admit it. Don't make something up. Mm -hmm. I don't think you would when it comes to the things of God. But if you think you know and you're not sure, it's not something you proclaim. But a one good answer to a question that someone asks you is this answer. Let's look it up. How do I get in got in? How do I get into heaven? Hmm. And when we answered that today, but I want you to look at this paragraph. An old Norwegian catechism describes Earth as an island colony to which God sent us for a limited time. <laughs> then it has God telling us the greatest danger is that you fall in love with this island so that you will not care to return to the home kingdom. Love the island because it is my possession. But do not love it because it is your home. It is not your home. Your home is here with me. Is that helpful? Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very, it's very, um, very clear. That's uh, comparing comparing the island is to the earth and earthly things. Yeah. Yeah. 
God created us and put us here to spend a short time before we went back with him. Is that easy or hard? Um, it's not, I don't think it's easy. Um, I don't want to die. I enjoy life. I enjoy living here, but, um, um, but I know that my time is limited here. So, and so what conclusion do you draw from that sentence? That I'm going to die and, and I hope that I will go back to be with God. You will, yes. So because your time is limited, this is a hard lesson for me, Mr. Procrastinator, Mr. <laughs> Easily distract, Distracted Person, <laughs> um, AADD. <laughs> um, it's a weakness. I have so many things I want to do. Yeah, we all do. And there's not enough time to do it. I'm not talking about the things we have to do. I know. I, I don't have time to do the things I want to do. <laughs> I know. I'm in love with this island to some extent. And when I tell my doctors, I love life, mm -hmm. I'm giving them an assignment to, <laughs> to do what they can to keep this going. Yeah. But they're not in control. The good ones know it. All right. Love not the world, neither the things of this world, for this world and the form of it or the things of it are passing away, said Jesus. Wow. I can't say it better than him. You see? Um, I've been blessed. Jeannie and I are richly blessed. So when I got that proverb this morning, I was comforted by it. I say to people, and you've heard me say this before, that there is a deed to the property that we have here, and it has her name and it has my name, but in invisible letters, God's name is there. And it's not our possession. He has lent it to us. And uh, we have poured a lot of ourselves into it for 41 years. Consider that. I always say we put our blood, sweat, and tears <laughs> into it. But what is hard to get across to, to self is it, it doesn't belong to you. You are a steward, not an owner. You take care of it. And one day, it will not be yours. And in that day, it won't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. No one from heaven looks back to what they had and wants to go back. But the Israelites who fell into the love of this, the things of this world, they wanted to go back to Egypt, to go back to Egypt was a metaphor for going back into slavery. And their answer was, well, slavery was better than being out here in nowhere land where all we've got is manna and water. And now we've got the quail. And to which you might answer, I, and, and is that a problem? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that. You were thinking that. What is your problem? You know how children are. I want what I want, and I want it when I want it. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that sin has to be 
pointed out, but I'm, I'm spending far too much time on this. And yet I think this is a key issue in American Christians who have been blessed. And um, this, this paragraph is a sermon. That would be a short one, wouldn't it? I sent this to a brother pastor who writes a devotion three or four days of week. And, and he loved it so much, he quoted this in his daily devotion. But I didn't dream it up. I got it on the internet. Okay, I think we can move on. We have a few minutes left. Um, Evelyn, I'm not sure if you noticed the clock. I think we started around 20 after. I think so. Okay, we'll go with that. The wonders of heaven. Heaven doesn't look like that. <laughs> but you and I look up into the clouds past which we cannot see. And it's kind of a mental image. Not looking up into clear blue sky, which also doesn't reveal much. The blue being caused by some kind of refraction index. I don't know the exact science. If you look past the atmosphere, you see black which is the absence of light. The wonders of heaven. So the next question I'd like to tackle, and we can only begin this time and we'll continue, is this idea of meeting God. Will I really meet God? And this brother pastor uh, that I was with this past seven, this past uh, five days, uh, we talked about this. The wonders of heaven. Will I really meet God? Well, let's begin with a story, and this is personal. I hope you don't mind a short personal story. I don't think I have shared it all with you, or maybe not at all. And we go back to 1980. It was July. It was immediately following the 20th of July, the date on which my father died. I had seen him two weeks earlier, and I, uh, I thought he was getting better. And we got, uh, uh, we re uh, finished worship and picked up the phone to call. And the nurse answered, uh, Jamie, you know exactly how a nurse answers that question. So I took a long plane trip and I was alone. Uh, Jeannie was with me two weeks earlier, but I traveled alone to Western Michigan and it was hard. My heart it was a grief of regret of not having spent more time with him. I would, if I knew he was going to die, would not have gone home earlier. But now I had to go back to a funeral. I had I had my Bible with me. And the question was, well, what should I read? I turned to Ecclesiastes and I had time to read all 12 chapters. Don't know why I picked Ecclesiastes. It wasn't because my dad was as rich as Solomon or from it. And it gave me a view of life not being satisfied by the things of this world. It was not because I was going to be called on to do the sermon 
No, my, uh, my friend and fellow classmate who had ministered to my father in the hospital when he was awake, told me about my father's confession of faith in Jesus. And now I was comforted. I understand. I am not going into detail about my father, but you can understand that a son might be comforted to know from a fellow pastor, your father died in faith. That's, that's comforting. And my friends, I want you to have that comfort about your loved ones so that when they die, you have grief, but not without hope. So how does this meet up with the question, will I really meet God? Well, let me answer it um, the long way around by saying, well, did you ever take a long trip when your heart was crushed by grief or loss? Well, I was with my mother um, when she um, actually was with her the day that we had to take her to the hospital and where she coded in the ER and then um, had to spend the rest of her life in the hospital, which wasn't long. Um, it was hard for me because I, well, I always wanted to spend more time with my mom, like you wanted to spend time with your dad and, and, um, you know, life sometimes doesn't give you that option. I had children to raise, I had a job I had to do. So I, I did the best I could. I tried to visit as often as I could. Sure. And it happened that I was there visiting that day that she had to go. So for that, for that part, I'm happy that I was there with, and with her, you know, mm -hmm. and could could accompany her. It was a hard trip. It was trip. very difficult. Yeah. It was. It was a hard trip. Yeah. And why is that? When, when we travel, we have that time of reflection uh, some regrets but maybe also some joy one of the purposes of a funeral beside the proclamation of the gospel is to give family members a chance to rehearse and to remember what is really important Maybe also to tell <laughs> uh, I'm just going to call them funny family stories. The ones that begin well, do you remember the time? <laughs> yeah. I was on a plane hoping to get back to Connecticut when I got a call saying that my mother was dying, hoping that I could get to the hospital ER in time and um, and I did uh, um, I told her that I was there she waited she was waiting for me um, I, I've told I told this story several times before but she said the angels came to the men came to get her to take her and she said, could you please wait until my daughter gets here? Hmm. And they said, yes. Oh. And um, so I got there and held her hand and I said, I'm here now. And, um, and I walked out of the room and uh, hmm. 
they gave her a needle for pain and she passed. Yeah, that's, that's a great witness, a good story. I thank you for, for sharing and I hope you accept my sharing of my story. I did not get there when my mother died and that was hard for a number of reasons, uh, but you can't fix what can't be fixed. Okay. Well, I don't want to dwell on this or we'll all need a box of Kleenex, which is not anything to be ashamed of. John 10 35, Jesus wept. Okay. And if he can weep over the death of his friend Lazarus, even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead in the next moment, <laughs> it's okay to weep with those who weep and to weep ourselves. Uh, let's not stay there, however. Now, there is a long trip mentioned in the New Testament of which I believe you are familiar. Okay. And I want you to guess, and there's an artist's uh, conception. What, what, um, what Bible passage do you think that's from? Uh, I don't know. Sorry. That's all right. I, I want to introduce you to, to this. It's one of my favorite stories. I don't like to call them stories, but let's get past that. It is in Luke chapter 24. Okay. There is Cleopas and his friend. And they don't know the man who is between them. They don't know who he is. The friend's name is not mentioned. Neither one belonged to the 12 apostles. The 11 that are left after the resurrection. And before you can go on, you have to stop and read Luke chapter 24, 11 through 35. I'm puzzled how I'm going to bring this to you because putting 13, 35, 20, uh, 23 verses on the screen, um, that's a lot, see? So, so that's not the way we do it. We do it another way. We do it uh, this way. Okay, so now you know where we're, where we are, and um, and you can see that, right? Yes. Yeah. Clear words. Yes. Now I suppose that we could say, "Read till you run out of breath." <clears throat> uh, let me save your voice and. <clears throat> That very day, and this is the day of the resurrection. This is Easter Sunday, as we call it. Oh. But that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. Now, forever and after, these are often called the Emmaus disciples. About seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem that does not, who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? 
And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, the man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they, body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were gathered with them together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Well, oh. that's a great story. Yeah. Uh, of what happened on Easter Sunday, beside the things that you are more familiar with. And I urge you to go and pick up your Bibles during uh, the week that follows and, and read for yourself a little slower maybe and ponder, uh, ponder what is going on, how Jesus revealed himself to Cleopas and the friend and how that applies to our question, will I really meet God? Because here indeed, our two disciples who thought he was dead, but now they have found him very much alive and glorified. How else could he vanish from their sight instantly? Don't try to find an answer to that question. It's not there. That they met God in the flesh, and now they knew that the resurrection was true. I think there's great humor in that story <laughs> that must have been that must have been so breathtaking for them oh, you know yes jesus yes. appeared to us to us who are we you know that that would have been a, such an amazing thing take your breath away we he came to us And by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Luke, the evangelist, was inspired to write it down for us. God wanted us to know this. The resurrected Christ made several appearances. Other reflections on this? Mm -hmm. I think that that is a good place to stop. Indeed, we have to stop. 
Will I really meet God? And a one word answer is yes. So let's, we're going to get by the grief part and go on to the joy next time. And uh, we'll rehearse a few verses of it to kind of recap. But I wanted you to get the whole story, the whole account, the whole narrative. Were you somewhat familiar with that portion? I had heard it before. Yeah, I heard the story before. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it didn't immediately come to mind. All right. What does it tell you? Jesus, Jesus made himself known to uh, to the disciples, and um, I believe that we're going to see him. He, he showed himself so to them, so he's going to show himself to us. Good promise to remember. Thank you. Yeah. He was known to them in the breaking of the bread and the blessing. When it when the account says their eyes were kept from recognizing him, that is God's action. You would think. <laughs> Now, we don't know how much time these disciples were with him and that they are not named as one of the 12. The reason that we know it, they are not one of the 12 is they returned and found the 11. The 11 is shorthand for everyone but Judas was there when they came back to tell what had happened to them. That's how we know Cleopas. Well, we had never heard that name before. And the friend is not named. Don't know why. Well, I'm going into details um, that aren't uh, pertinent. And we've did, covered Luke, did Luke my, mention why Jesus chose Cleopas? No. Uh, may could I make that? Yeah, it could have been. Evelyn, yeah. I can make an application. Did Jesus tell us why he chose us? No. It was nothing in us that made him choose us, but in his divine and intentional choice. They happened to be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> And that was by God's arrangement. Right. But what a what a beautiful revelation to them. Well, I will really meet God and I'll meet you here, God willing, and some of the others that are usually with us. And uh let's uh let's close with a prayer about this, huh? Oh Jesus revealing yourself to those you have chosen and choosing those to whom you will reveal yourself. Give us comfort in the promise of the resurrection and in the promise that indeed you are the way to heaven and upon our death we will meet you. We will know you and we will want to be known. Thank you, Lord, for this comforting promise of resurrection which we apply please lord not only to us us but also to those that we have placed in a grave those we remember and those you have given us in the past to love as we are loved by them thank you for the promise that you fulfilled in them and gave to us in some measure through them. 
who were witnesses themselves of their faith in you. Thank you. We ask it in your holy name. Amen. Amen.